and welcome to Middlebury First United Methodist Church. We are so glad you have chosen to worship with us this morning, and we're glad that you are here with us online. I have a few announcements and reminders for you before we dig in. First, believe it or not, Advent begins next Sunday. We will have some poinsettias available for purchase if you are interested. Uh, we just have eight of them, and they are $15 a piece. But if you're interested, please contact the church office, and we would be glad to get you connected with one. We also want to let you know that we will have um, a short piece available for kiddos about halfway through the week. Pastor Caleb's going to work on a uh, like a kiddos devotion that we'll post online, so be looking for that midweek. As well, we appreciate your understanding as we have shifted our worship service and our meetings online. Um, Elkhart County is in the red level advisory category as we find on the Indiana State Department of Health Health's COVID-19 dashboard. And as long as we're under that advisory, um, this is the decision that our COVID response team has made to keep things online. So we will be sure to keep you updated as we continue to move forward and hope to be able to see you all back soon. Well, this morning we are continuing on in our double take sermon series and we want to begin with a time of prayer as we talk about faith and as we talk about hope and we talk about uh, the trauma that we find ourselves in sometimes it's important to stop for a minute and to begin to identify our own readiness for healing our own readiness to move forward in faith and so I'd like to begin our service this morning by walking us through a prayer experience. Now, some of you have seen that I often have prayer beads with me on a Sunday morning. There is, as I wrap it, there is a uh, cross that I've got at the bottom of it. There are some larger beads. There are some smaller beads. And uh, so there's about seven in between each of those. And so this um, one that I'm going to lead us through this morning uh, is from a book called Beads of Healing by Kristen Vincent. She does a great job talking about prayer beads. And this particular one is an experience about speaking your truth and paying attention to our readiness for healing. So I'm going to walk us through this and give us time for reflection, give us time to process through um, our own experience. So as we continue to remember those that um, we know have asked for prayer, as we continue to remember our own needs and requests and the conversations we have, let us go to God in prayer. God of light, Help me to speak my truth by the power of your son, Jesus Christ. I hear Jesus asking me, do you want to be healed? So let us each take a moment and listen to that question of Jesus. Do we want to be healed? We wonder, are we truly ready to be healed? So let us take a moment and lift up any of our fears and concerns and questions that we might have about our own readiness to be healed. God, we don't know what to expect on our healing journey. So let us take a minute to envision what our healing journey might look like. And try to be as specific as possible. What will we feel along this healing journey? What will happen? Who will be involved? What will we need? Where can we go for comfort? And what activities will nurture us along the way? What might we expect or find? on our healing journey. God, we ask for your help and your guidance along the way. So let us take a moment to pray for a sense of God's presence, God's comfort and God's guidance along our healing journey.
We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has the power to heal us. Amen. I'm excited about our Double Take Sermon series. We have taken a singular scripture from Hebrews chapter 10, and we have pulled out two very distinct sermons. As a pastor, we have the opportunity uh, when we look at a scripture and as we go before God in prayer and, and look for discernment, there are so many different threads that a singular scripture can um, speak to us and places we can pull out. Uh, I've shared that when I was in seminary, one of my classes, we did a Lectio Divina exercise where the professor would read a scripture to us every single time that we met, and we would listen and pray as we heard this scripture being read to us. In particular, the professor chose to read Psalm 23, and he would read it three times through every single class period. And I don't think any class period I heard the same thing twice. God speaks to us in a multitude of ways and sometimes through those exact same scriptures that we read over and over again. The rabbis believe that scripture is a deep well from which we can pull from, that we continue to find and hear different ways that God speaks to us based on our context, based on what we're going through, based on what God wants to teach us in the moment. So we're excited to bring to you two distinct sermons from Book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Well, welcome and good morning, First United Methodist Church, it is great to be here this morning. You are uh, seeing me in my basement recording uh, this sermon, but uh, thankful for technology and we can still uh, be able to worship God and to be able to learn more about him. This is our double take sermon series where we are examining Hebrews chapter 10 and getting two different takes on it. So I'm glad that you're able to join me here this morning. I have some notes that will appear on the television screen here. Hope you can read it. I made it hopefully big enough uh, instead of having screen. So uh, would you join me in a word of prayer before we dive in to the book of Hebrews? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you as we are able to worship you, as we are able to learn more about you uh, in different ways. God, I am thankful for technology where we can still be able to have a sermon and have music and still be able to communicate with one another, even though we may not be able to see each other face to face on a Sunday morning right now. God, we thank you and we praise you. And I pray that you would open the hearts of my and minds that are hearing this sermon right now. It's in your heavenly name I pray. Amen. So as you can see from my television screen here, we are looking at faith. And what is faith exactly? We'll be jumping into the book of Hebrews today. But before we do, I want to have a little bit of an understanding of what the book of Hebrews is or what we know what it is and what it was used for. So much of the Old Testament is a collection of letters, mainly written by Paul, but we have the gospel and we have the letters written by Paul and we have multiple different authors. And we have this book, Hebrews, that is titled because we basically the only thing we know is the audience and the audience would have been a former or well, they were Jewish, not even former Jews. They were Jews that were converted to being followers of Jesus and so the writer here, who we don't know who it is, it could be Priscilla, it could be Luke, who wrote Luke Acts, it could be Paul, but probably not very likely. We just, we really don't know who the author is. But we're pretty confident that we know the audience. And so again, this was written to the Hebrew people and under the assumption that they knew some of the Hebrew text and language. And this book... Well, we call it a book. We really don't know what genre it is. It could have been a, uh, it probably was a letter, but again, we really don't know. But this would have been read aloud to a group of people in, the, in a worship setting. So people would gather in their homes and they would hear the entire book read from start to end. And there were no chapters. There were no verse letterings. And those were added about 1,500 years after the author wrote this book. So the Geneva Bible in 1560 was the first Bible ever to actually use verse numbers and chapter numbers. Up until then, 
we had, they didn't have, you know, if we would have said Hebrews 11.1, 1, it probably would have looked at you and went, 11.1, 1, it's just, it's a whole letter, it's a whole piece, it's an entire scroll. And so this morning, I'm going to be extending our scripture by one verse um, from what we had uh, last week, but we're going to dive in and see and read, uh, rather, see and read. Uh, Hebrews 10 chapter, Hebrews chapter 10 verses 32 through 39, and I'm including 11.1 because honestly, I think the chapter should end at 11.2, but 1500 years ago, they didn't consult me and how they divided up how the books were going to be. So, you know, uh, you know I wish I could have been there and did that decision making process, but I wasn't. So, uh, again, I'm including that here uh, this morning. But remember the early days after you saw the light. You stood your ground while you were suffering from an enormous amount of pressure. Sometimes you were exposed to insults and abuse in public. Other times you became partners with those who were treated that way. You even showed sympathy toward people in prison and accepted the confiscation of your possessions with joy since you knew you had a better and lasting possession. So don't throw away your confidence. It brings great reward. You need to endure so that you can receive the promises after you do God's will. Now we're going to uh, pause here for a moment. Uh, the author of Hebrews does something that me as an English teacher, I really, really enjoy. So the next couple of verses, we're going to see uh, the author is going to call back to the book of Habakkuk. And I hope I spelled it right. Spell check doesn't exactly like spell check uh, Habakkuk. So, but they, they call, uh, the author calls back to Habakkuk, uh, assuming that the audience is already familiar with the Hebrew Bible, or what we call the Old Testament. And so, as an English teacher, I like this because at the start, the author makes their claim, and now they're providing textual evidence, and then we will see in Hebrews 11.1, 1, the author makes or analyzes that uh, claim and support uh, and provides an argument. Uh, so, a little bit of an English lesson there. Claim, support, with textual evidence, and then uh, analysis of what that means Makes me really happy. Makes me really happy to see that the biblical authors um, are good at like trying to prove their point. And so the author here calls back to Habakkuk. In a little while longer, the one who is coming will come and won't delay. But my righteous one will live by faith and my whole being won't be pleased with anyone who shrinks back. Again, that was a callback to Habakkuk. And then the author here gives their analysis of saying, don't shrink back. The author says, but we aren't the sort of people, we aren't, who timidly draw back and end up being destroyed. We are the sort of people who have faith so that our whole beings are preserved. And so the author claims that we have faith. I know we all have faith. And then the author goes on to give a definition of what faith is. And it's very rare that we actually see this in the Bible. You know, Jesus teaches in parables, and he even says, not everyone's going to understand this because it's a roundabout way of teaching, but author of Hebrews cut and dry and says, this is what faith is. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. And so, the author is calling people to not shrink away because obviously there have been persecutions. There have been uh, plights against the people who follow Jesus. Again, Paul himself, before he was Paul, he was Saul. And he went around and murdered people who followed Jesus. So, yeah, not exactly the greatest of times to be a follower of Jesus. We're pretty lucky uh, in the sense that people aren't trying to kill us because we follow Jesus. But the Hebrew people um, who have converted to following Jesus or have uh, been convinced that, that Jesus is God and he is meant to save them and he is the Savior, they're being persecuted uh, against because they follow Jesus. And so the author is saying, don't shrink back. 
Keep going. Persevere. The perseverance of having faith. But what exactly is faith? Again, we know that the, that the author gives us this definition, um, but I want to examine that definition just a little more closely because, again, I'm, I'm picky with words. Shocker, I know. And the way we understand faith is extremely, extremely important. And I want to make sure we get it right. And so the first thing uh, we, we're going to do is we are going to examine what faith is not. So we have to make sure that we have a correct understanding of faith by understanding what faith isn't. Uh, so this verse 11 in Hebrews 11, 1, it gets translated a little bit differently between a couple of versions. Now, you all may be familiar with the NIV and the ESV translation. Fun fact, the NIV translation is the most popular Western translation of the Bible. It's the most popular. It's the one that the most Christians use, and I'm going to pick on it a little bit because, again, I am picky about how words are constructed and how the Greek is translated to make sure we have a good and correct understanding of the Bible. And so the ESV and NIV read it this way. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And our translation is the Common English Bible, which I have come to love and appreciate because it really, uh, it makes things really easy to understand, but also makes sure it gets the correct connotation of what the Greek is trying to get at. And so the CEB translates 11.1 as this. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we cannot see. And so you see these two words here, assurance and reality. And we recognize that those aren't exactly the same word, are they? Uh, they have different definitions and they have different connotations to them. So again, I'm going to get a little picky here and we're going to dive into that. So the Greek word that is translated differently both times is this Greek word called hypostasis. And this is uh, the Caleb Strom way of pronouncing it, hypostasis. I kind of got hungry while I was uh, preparing this sermon, so, uh, you know, reminded me of pasta. Uh, but hypostasis. And so this word hypostasis uh, it does mean assurance, but it more so means something, it's literally translated, something that has substance, something that is real, or something that has a firm foundation. And so substance and reality, I think, have a better connotation to them. Otherwise, if we just have confidence and hope or assurance, you know, that's, that's more passive. You know, that's a faith that is more passive. Versus substance and reality, those are words that say, hey, your faith is to be made known in the world. Reality is something that is real. It is something that is made known in our world. And so we think of something that has a firm foundation. We think of something that has substance. It is real. It is tangible. And so when we go back to... 11.1, one. oops, faith is the substance of what we hope for, or faith is to make known what we hope for, the proof of what we cannot see. So I have a little illustration to uh, kind of go along with this. You may have heard this illustration before, but... You know, faith is something that we need to act on. It's not just something we have. We can't just, you know, dance around like the TikToks. If you see, you know, Holy Spirit, activate, activate, activate. Holy Spirit, activate. That, that just doesn't happen. We can't just activate the Holy Spirit and just, okay, um, faith is there. I have it. And all I have to do is sit and do nothing. No, faith, is, faith is active. It is a behavior. And so uh, this illustration that I use, um, there was a, 
um, there was a town that was about to get hit by a huge storm. And there was a faithful man sitting and watching the television. And he saw that this storm was coming and didn't think much of it. Um, you know, he prayed that he would remain safe and he was confident. And all of a sudden he hears a, a knock on the door. And so he comes out of his house and he opens the door and there's a bunch of people gathered and, and they have a van and, and they say, sir, the, the storm is coming. It's going to hit. Massive flooding is about to happen. We need to get out now in order to live. And the man responds, no, it's okay. I am a faithful man. I prayed that I would be saved and I'm confident that God's going to save me. So the group went, well, okay, all right. And, and they left in their van and uh, the man went back to his couch and, and uh, was sitting there and the, the rains came and the winds came and all of a sudden the, the water is rising and rising and rising. And the man realizes that he hit, gets that, have, has to get on top of the roof because the water has risen so quickly. And the man is sitting on the roof praying to God, being faithful. Again, this is a faithful man, a man who has faith in God. And the, uh, someone from a boat comes up and, and comes up next to his roof because the water has risen that high. And uh, the guy in the boat says, sir, come with me if you want to live. The water is rising rapidly. Come with me if you want to be saved. The man said, no, no, it's okay. I have faith that God will save me. So the guy in the boat said, all right, and, and, and drove on off. And again, the man sat on his roof and continued to pray. And the waters rose and the waters rose. And all of a sudden, the man is, is treading water. He's doggy paddling. And he sees a helicopter up in the distance. And, and the, uh, the rescue people come on down. They have that ladder, you know, outstretched arm and everything. They're trying to throw him life preservers. And, and they go, sir, come with us if you want to live. The water, like... You will not last much longer. The man says, no, no, it's okay. I have faith that God will save me. So the people in the helicopter were like, okay. And they left and went on their way. Well, the waters kept on rising and eventually the man tired and, and he had drowned. And he uh, was faced with the pearly gates of heaven. And as he entered, he sees God. And the first thing he asks is, God. I've been a faithful man. Why didn't you save me? And God gives them this look and says, I sent three vehicles. I sent three different groups. What more do you want me to do? Sometimes our faith is more than just sitting around and waiting for these things to happen. Sometimes faith is about getting up and doing something. If you are to read the rest of Hebrews 11, which I urge all of you to do, it is a great chapter. It's actually known as the faith chapter. The rest of Hebrews 11 gives examples of people who had faith, but not only did they have faith, the author says this is what they did to show it. This is what they did to be shown as faithful and righteous. Well, if you don't believe me and my interpretation of the Greek and hypostasis and what that means, uh, there's another writer in the New Testament that really pushes the point that faith requires action and not passivity. This guy is by the name of James, and he's the brother of Jesus. So, I mean, you'd think he might know what he's talking about. Uh, but James chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, it says this. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith, but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Someone might claim, you have faith and I have action. But how can I see your faith apart from your actions? Instead, I will show you my faith 
by putting it into practice and faithful action. It's good that you believe that God is one. <laughs> Even the demons believe this and they tremble with fear. Are you so slow? Do you need to be shown that faith without actions has no value at all? What about Abraham, our father? Wasn't he shown to be righteous through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? See, his faith was at work along with his actions. In fact, his faith was made complete by his faithful actions. So the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed in God and God regarded him as righteous. What is more, Abraham was called God's friend. So you see that a person is shown to be righteous through faithful actions and not through faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute shown to be righteous when she received the messengers as her guests and then sent them on by another road? And here's the kicker. As the lifeless body is dead, so faith without actions is dead. That's a uh, that's hard, doesn't it? I mean, I I really like James because of the fact that he really doesn't pull any punches. Uh, in fact, one of his insults here, he says, "Are you slow?" Well, the actual Greek there, again, we're going back to some of the Greek stuff because I think it's fascinating. The actual translation of that Greek term right there is you have, you are a vessel with no substance. James is basically saying, if you think you have faith, but don't do anything with it, there's nothing, there's nothing in between your ears. That's what he says. Don't yell at me. Go, go yell at the guy who wrote a book of the Bible. Because that's what he claims. So again, when scripture said that, the script, that scripture is supposed to pierce us like a double-edged sword, I didn't exactly think I was going to be insulted. Or like, or James, he's punching me in the gut. Saying, hey, wake up. You claim to have faith. Do something about it. And this is why I think the when we uh, looked at the hypothesis word before, I think it's better to say reality because it matches with the other biblical authors looking at faith as well. We need to have a good definition of faith so that we don't remain passive, so that we don't just sit in the pews and wait for something to happen. Well, we have faith, God, do something. The Bible says it doesn't work that way. The Bible says if we do that, our faith is dead. We actually, we don't have faith at that point because it's lifeless and dead. So again, James punches you in the gut when he says this, calls everyone to wake up and said, hey, if you claim to have faith, which a lot of us do claim to have faith, then our behavior ought to show it. Our behavior ought to be Ones that the things that we hope for, we hope that justice is served, that we hope that the poor uh, are fed and clothed and are made to be shown or are, are shown the love of Jesus. We want people to know God. We want to love other people. And we have faith that will happen. But if we, if we don't do anything about it, our faith is dead. And it won't happen. God works through us and in us. I don't know if you're familiar with a pretty popular Christian musician. He was really popular back in the late 80s uh, and early 90s. His name was uh, Rich Mullins. Uh, the, song, or the photo's kind of blurry here. It's better on my computer screen, so sorry about that. Uh, but Rich Mullins was a singer and songwriter. He actually uh, passed away near my hometown by being struck by a car. But uh, I really like him because he called himself a ragamuffin Christian. You know, someone who wasn't perfect. He didn't have all things 
uh, sorted out or right. But you know what? Jesus, he really liked him and really wanted to pursue him. And a lot of his music is really, really great. And actually, fun fact, if you're familiar with the cups, the, the cups beat uh, that Anna Kendrick does in her movie Pitch Perfect, the pop, 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 that, that one, uh, Rich Mullins actually was the one who invented that because I learned it at church camp because of this song, Screen Door. And I was going to play it for everyone uh, on Sunday, but uh, unfortunately, because we're streaming this online, this is copyrighted. So if you want to go look up the song, please do. It's called Screen Door by Rich Mullins. And I want to share with you a couple of lyrics from the song because it, like James, punches us, punches us in the gut and shakes us and wakes us up to say, hey, again, if you want to have faith, you got to do something. So a couple of the lyrics from his songs. It, faith, is about as useless as a screen door on a submarine. So James uses the uh, metaphor uh, that faith without works is dead. Or the, um, and uh, Rich Mullins here says, faith without works, it's a screen door on a submarine. Pretty inventive. Faith without works, baby, it just ain't happening. Another line is, well, there's a difference, you know, between having faith and playing make-believe. That is hard. One will make you grow, and the other one will just make you sleep. Man, that is hard this morning, doesn't it? Different examples of ways that we shouldn't just sit and wait for things to happen. We can't just clap our hands and tell the Holy Spirit to activate. We have to be the hands and feet of Jesus. In order to have faith, we need to go out, to go. Baptize people of all nations, teaching them everything that Jesus had done. There's lots of verbs to that, as Dr. Byron said when he visited. Go, do. Faith requires faithful action. Example, last week in our children's moment, Indiana Jones making the jump to cross the chasm. Faith requires taking risks and knowing that the things that we hope for will come to pass because we have faith in God. All right, so this is the big idea. If you've checked out, if you only listened to the first two minutes and then all of a sudden you fell asleep or uh, you were skipping around in the, in the time bar uh, on the video, this, this is what I want you to hear. So if you've missed everything else, stick with me for the next 45 seconds because this is the gist of pretty much everything that I've said here this morning. So the big idea is what is faith then? What is it? Faith is the action of a behavior that makes what we hope for a reality in the world that we live in. We have faith and we make it a reality of the world that we live in. The faithful don't sit around and wait for things to happen. The faithful make things happen. As Coach Harms tells us on a fairly regular occasion, it's a great, great day if you make it that way. Faith requires action. Faithful make things happen. And I hope it is so for all of us this morning. Amen. And he is jealous for me. Loves like a hurricane. I am a tree. Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me I
Good and gracious God, we are thankful for your presence here with us and within us. And we ask now, oh God, this word, this message that has been prepared, may it be of you and may it be from you. And may our hearts, our ears, and our lives be ready to receive whatever it is that you have for us this day. Amen. I heard a story this past week about a 14-year-old, it's about freshman, and he was in an advanced history class. And the history teacher staged an argument with another one of the teachers, and at the culmination of the fight, his classroom teacher kicked out the other teacher. The students were asked to write what they saw of the incident so that a report could be put together and they could turn that into the principal. So the students set to writing. The next day, the students came in, prepared to turn in their reports. And what they learned was that the whole thing had been staged, and we may ask why, <laughs> to show that none of their reports were exactly the same. Some of the reports were different based on which teacher the students sympathized with. Some of them were different based on what angle the student was sitting in the room. And the teacher concluded the lesson by saying, history is written by the people who observed it from the angle they observed it, informed by their culture and their history. What we often forget is that Scripture is the story of the people of God told by those who observed it from the angle they observed it, and it's informed by their culture and by their history. What's interesting is when we look at the ark, the narrative of the people of God, of course we see there is a constant cycle of sin, repentance, redemption, and sinning all over again, but even more so we see that so much of Scripture tells us the stories of people who are entering trauma, who are in the thick of trauma, and who are coming out of trauma. Just story after story after story of people who are experiencing pain and disruption and uncertainty. All the way from the beginning where we have Adam and Eve who are kicked out of paradise, to Abraham, who's planning to sacrifice his son Isaac, to Joseph being sold into slavery, to the Exodus, which, let's talk about the Exodus for just a minute here. First of all, this is large-scale enslavement and persecution, an entire people group. And it's followed by genocide, and then it's followed by plagues. And then it's followed by even harsher abuse by Pharaoh when he's afraid the people are going to leave. And when they're finally freed, when Moses is finally to say, let my people go, and Moses says, yes, they escape only to be chased after by their abusers who really just want to annihilate them and or enslave those who survive. Miraculously, they cross the sea into 40 years of wandering. And while they're wandering, there are at least two major epidemics which kill tens of thousands of people. The first one kills nearly 15,000. The second one kills nearly 25,000. And then Moses, their penultimate father figure, leader, and savior, dies, leaving them to a period of prolonged warfare and an incredibly difficult transition as they are trying to conquer Canaan under the new leadership of this guy, Joshua. None of that includes the repeated destruction of Israel and Judah, its population and its cities, the capital of Jerusalem, and the burning of not only the first temple, but the second temple. This is scratching the surface of the first 2,000 years of Jewish history, which, by the way, is our history. Taken as a whole, we begin to see the story of the people of God as a story that is filled with trauma. So trauma, let's talk about it. That's a really big, ugly word for a Sunday morning, right? Who woke up this morning and went, yes, let's talk about it. You're welcome. We often believe that trauma relates to something extremely stressful, even equate it to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But the reality is that trauma is defined as a rupture in meaning-making and how we find meaning and what we make of the world. 
David Tricky, who's a psychologist and representative of the United Kingdom's Trauma Council, describes it as this. When the way you see yourself, the way you see the world, and the way you see other people are shocked and overturned by an event, and then a gap arises between your orienting systems and that particular event, and simple stress will cascade into trauma, often mediated through sustained and severe feelings of helplessness. In a phrase, trauma turns your world upside down. It challenges your core beliefs. It makes you question things like your self-worth and your security and meaning in the world may even challenge your belief in God. It changes how we see the world. It changes how we see other people. It changes how we see ourselves. And sometimes trauma will be um, severe enough that it will permanently color the lens through which a person sees the world. Never able to see the world the same. They say when trauma happens, the basic tissues of our social lives, things like our origin stories and how we expect people to behave and our rituals and our shared institutions and social spaces and the relationship that we have with other people, that can all be torn to bits by a traumatic event. It sounds kind of extreme. Jeffrey Alexander, sociologist at Yale, throws this into the mix. He said the U.S.'s social tissues, for example, are consumed by a feeling of chaos being out of control as if the country is falling apart. Imagine how much more so the people of ancient Israel, the people of God, how much more so they felt they were being torn apart. Episcopal priest Whitney Rice has named it well when she has said, the Bible is post-traumatic literature. All of what we read in Scripture is written for a people by a people who are experiencing trauma, by people who had seen some stuff. And this is the whole crux of the book of Revelation. It's written to a people who are feeling helpless and desperate up against horrific times, and it's written to remind them, do not despair, do not lose hope. You are seen, you are known, and you are loved. This is the message to the people in exile. This is the message to the diaspora, the scattered, to David as he flees across the countryside, to Mary and Joseph as they're on the run, to the disciples after they've watched their friend be executed, to Paul as he's in prison, to the people hiding in underground house churches. This is the message we hear to the persecuted, to those who've been dismissed by society, to those on the fringes, to those who have lost their footing. And this is the message to the Hebrews. So in the book of Hebrews this morning, we don't know a whole lot about it. We don't know who wrote it. We don't even know if Hebrews was the actual title of it. We don't know if it's a homily or a letter. We don't know what historical situation has precipitated. We've got guesses, but we don't know for certain. What we do know is it was addressing a people who were experiencing, catch this, a fearful sense of powerlessness in the face of mysteriously rising adversities. Does that sound familiar? It's amazing to me every time I turn back to Scripture and I read more pieces of it, and I go, man, that sounds like really relevant to my current life and situation and context. Feeling powerlessness in the face of these mysteriously rising adversities. And so these people find themselves on a pilgrimage, a journey, if you will just like the people of God before them, navigating what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus in an incredibly challenging world. What Hebrews argues is that Christ is the ruler of all things, of all things. And we as a people of faith need to be willing to undertake that journey of faith, asking us to shift from the known into the unknown. Reminding us that we can't manipulate the world or the cosmic forces in order to have more control over our lives. Reminding us that we are called to be willing to live with a sense of insecurity and to find meaning along the way. Scholar Rob Jewett, he writes this, 
There is not a single indication in this, the book of Hebrews, this profound writing that humankind can opt out of the historical process, find security by going backward, or discover some final solution to its plight. Jesus himself shared the dilemma and strides before us to lead his followers to endure and to give thanks for their secure relationship with God who shakes the earth and the heavens. In fact, Jewett argues, when we seek to control our situations, when we seek to manipulate our circumstances, when we try to add security and happiness to our lives, we actually deepen rather than resolve the sense within us of human insecurity and bad conscience and alienation. Now let that sink in for just a second. When we're unwilling to engage in a genuine conversation, to honestly admit that we have seen some things, that we've been through some things, that life has been hard, and we're unwilling to deal with it from a healthy perspective, and instead just try to change it or control it or avoid it or deny it, we're actually deepening rather than resolving. We're making worse rather than better our sense of insecurity, our sense of guilt, and our alienation from one another and from God. What I love about Hebrews is it has this fierce sense of realism and honesty. It rejects this idea that cities last forever. It shatters the idea of control and insists that we have honest and genuine dialogue. So here's the situation they're faced with. The original audience of Hebrews lived in a world that felt to struggle was a contradiction to Christian faith. That if you just had enough faith, if you just believed hard enough and correctly enough that life would be secure and safe and blessed, that God would protect you from hardship. The author of Hebrews knew it was important to reframe this, to to draw it back to their own life experience, and the author reminds them of what they've been up against. They're beginning, verse 32, the struggles, the insults, the abuse that they have faced, and the author reminds them of the faith they've maintained in the meantime. The author says, have you struggled? People go, "Uh uh-huh. He says, are you still people of faith? Mm Mm-hmm. He says, these two things are not incompatible. Of course, the question at hand, the thing that we're all asking is, why? (laughs) Why can my faith not keep me safe and secure from struggle? Why is my faith not protecting me from experiencing trauma in my life? To which the author of Hebrews says, I'm so glad you asked. Trauma and faith go together because the place of Christian experience, the place we live out our faith, is not in the heavenly realms, is not in the hereafter, but is here on this deteriorating and hostile earth. Man, that sounded like really depressing. Jewett writes, to worship in the hushed and sheltered sanctuary, surrounded by fellow believers may not involve great risk. And thus, it doesn't demand courageous faith. But to worship in the secular world, with its threats, its uncertainties, and its inevitable suffering, that requires a constant and assured faith. And as long as people refuse to accept that unpleasant reality that we find in the book of Hebrews, believing that faith instead is going to produce success and happiness, Jewett says there is no possibility for genuine faith to emerge. Our faith is formed not in the silent reverence of the sanctuary, but in the crucible of life's most difficult moments. Our faith is formed not in the silent reverence of the sanctuary, but in the crucible of life's most difficult moments. 
rubber meets the road, cards on the table. Nothing about life has been easy since March of 2020. The collective trauma that we have experienced, whether we're willing to admit it or not, is nearly immeasurable. Our behavior as a people, as a congregation, as a community, as a nation, it's been abysmal. Our service workers were beyond burned out a year ago. Our healthcare staffs are barely hanging on. Our leaders, including educators and clergy, are leaving the profession in droves. I spoke with a colleague just this week who said they're living in some sort of cloud of grief and hell. People are tired of being abused and beat down and screamed at and dismissed. People are exhausted from having to think through every single interaction and activity, measuring risk for reward and the divisiveness off the chart. And while it appears that the end may be in sight for the pandemic from a medical perspective as we celebrate the broader access to vaccines, there are times when it feels like the damage to our social tissues, those bonds that hold us together, the fractures that have begun to exist in our relationships and communities, it feels like the damage has been done. We are living in traumatic times. Not to mention the individual trauma that so many of us have experienced apart from the pandemic. The sudden death of a child, a new cancer diagnosis, job loss, significant storm damage, verbal and physical abuse, an unexpected hospitalization or surgery, a cancer that's returned, the death of a spouse. It's a lot. It's it's a lot. It is hard and it is heavy. We are carrying this weight. (laughs) Who am I to stand up here and preach faith? In the face of all of this, Being a person of faith, living a life of faith, does not mean that the hard stuff goes away, and it doesn't mean that it's any easier. Hard stuff and traumatic stuff will always be hard. It will always be traumatic. It will always require facing it head on and moving through it in healthy ways. But instead, being a person of faith, living a life of faith, means recognizing that we share a story with a people who have been through it too. With a people who have proved to be resilient and bold. With a people who have been up against the hardest of the hard and who have come through it with a courageous and genuine faith. Doesn't mean they didn't doubt. Doesn't mean they didn't struggle. Doesn't mean that they didn't tear their faith apart and slowly put it together piece by piece. They just knew that they served a God who had struggled too. Lucky for us. They wrote the book on being a people of faith in post-traumatic times. Verse 30. We are not the sort of people who timidly draw back and end up being destroyed. We're the sort of people who have faith so that our whole beings are preserved. The community of faith continued to exist throughout all of the stuff that they had seen because they chose to respond with resilience. Not by saying, well, soon I'll be in heaven so I don't have to deal with any of this. Or, well, you know, all that matters is that I get to heaven, the rest of this is inconsequential. They said, this life matters. Who I am matters. What I do matters. How I engage and treat and serve others matters. My capacity to work with God towards redemption and restoration, that matters. You see, life can throw all that it wants at me, but I will not back down and I will not give up because Jesus did not back down and Jesus did not give up. Life can be Traumatic. It can cause us to want to scream and to cry and to throw all of the things. 
And while I don't have any easy answers today, there are rarely easy answers. What I want to offer instead is a reminder. Not that things will get better. Not that the not okay will suddenly become okay. But that we are not alone. That there are people who have been where we are and have struggled through the things that we have struggled through and they have come out on the other side with a bold and courageous and resilient and genuine faith. And a reminder that this this book, this scripture, it's not a book of feel-good stories that we thumb through and hope our finger will land on something that will give us the inspiration we need for the day. This book instead is the story of the people of God wandering through some of life's most difficult moments and finding God in the midst of them. Not as a divine hand who's going to pull them out of the pit of despair, but as a fellow sojourner who's going to sit with them in the pain and in the heartache. Reminding them, reminding us, do not despair. Do not lose hope. You are seen, you are loved, you are known. You are not alone, and this will not last forever. As we close out our service today, I wanted to end with a prayer from Gorillas of Grace by Ted Loder. This particular one is entitled, Sometimes It Just Seems to Be Too Much. Sometimes, Lord, it just seems to be too much. Too much violence, too much fear, too much of demands and problems, too much of broken dreams and broken lives, too much of war and slums and dying, too much of greed and squishy fatness and the sounds of people devouring each other and the earth. Too much of stale routines and quarrels, unpaid bills and dead ends. Too much of words lobbed in to explode and leaving shredded hearts and lacerated souls. Too much of turned away backs and yellow silence, red rage and the bitter taste of ashes in my mouth. Sometimes the very air seems scorched by threats and rejection and decay until there is nothing but to inhale pain and exhale confusion. Too much of darkness, Lord, too much of cruelty and selfishness and indifference. Too much, Lord, too much, too bloody, bruising, brainwashing much, or is it too little? Too little of compassion, too little of courage, of daring, of persistence, of sacrifice, too little of music and laughter and celebration. Oh, God. Make of me some nourishment for these starved times. Some food for my brothers and sisters who are hungry for gladness and hope. That being bread for them, I may also be fed and full. Go in God's peace. Amen.